But it's so good to have them from now. Oklahoma says Ada, Oklahoma, but Kanawha. 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 tells me a lot because I just want to know a lot about close to Ada. I, I figured it out. Ada. Oh, 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 oh. All right. We can talk about Oklahoma. Don't be like the Texan <laughs> who went to a, to a funeral and, and nobody was standing up to say anything about this guy, you know? And he stood up. Well, if nobody has anything to say, I just like to talk a little bit about Texas. <laughs> you know how those Texans are. Yeah. Uh -oh. Amen. But anyway, I'm going to turn the service to Brother Drew. I was glad that he was going to be here. And you're going to talk about your book, I'm assuming, and all that. All right. God bless you as you come. Let's welcome him. Because uh, the bank there has been robbed twice. <laughs> it's only, uh, Carnival's only population 1,200. And uh, the bank's been robbed twice. And once by a pretty boy Floyd back in the 30s. Wow, wow. And then once by my Uncle Vernon. <laughs> True story. And uh, after Uncle Vernon got out of uh, government housing, he. Uh, he moved back to Kanawha, and from the bank he robbed, he borrowed money to build his house. <laughs> I guess when they, I guess when they did the credit check, they, they checked for, for bankruptcy, but not bank robbery. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and when he robbed the bank, his brother Orville, his older brother Orville Isaacs, was the mayor of the town. <laughs> now, I'm not making this up. This is this is the gospel here. And, uh, and so the Oklahoma City paper that went all over the state got wind of this, and the headlines, this is back in like 63, the headlines for the whole state paper was Mayor's Brother Robs Bank. <laughs> so that's, that's good news from uh, Uncle Vernon. How many have Uncle Vernon in your family? All right, well, there's a few of us. So. Anyway, it's good to be here. Uh, I'll never forget the day that I first met Sister Kendra. She doesn't remember it, but I remember it very well. I got saved in the Assembly of God Church in Clifton, Arizona. And uh, when I was 16 years old. And a few months later, we went on a youth rally over to Bylas on the reserva reservation there in Bylas. And uh, there was this lady playing and singing like I'd never heard anybody play and sing. In all my all my life, and she uh, she sang and preached. And my brother Aaron Isaacs. I don't know if anybody's ever met my brother Aaron. He used to teach school in uh, Marinci. Uh, but he looked at me and he said, "That lady can sing." So <laughs> anyway, that's how I don't know if we ever formally met, but then we've known over the years, uh, family and relatives. And so it's just good to be here. My wife Phyllis here, born and raised in Flagstaff. Uh, especially proud of her after we moved to Conewa, Oklahoma 20, almost five years ago. She had never been to college. And long story short, not only did she go to college there, she went on and taught high school in, in, uh, for about five years, then went and got her master's degree, and then went on to get her PhD. 
and uh, got hired at East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma. And now she is the chair, or she runs the education department at East Central University. So I tell everybody, since her name is Phyllis, that I'm married to Dr. Phil. So, <laughs> When, awesome. when, she, when she graduated, I made t-shirts up, and, and uh, I made four of them because her mom and dad, Jim and Betty came back, and their t-shirt said, uh, my daughter is Dr. Phil. And I, I had a t-shirt on that said, I'm married to Dr. Phil. And then she, I got one for her, and she said, I'm Dr. Phil. Uh, so anyway, uh, we've never worn those t-shirts, but it was it, fun <laughs> All right. <coughs> I'm really, I brought some water. Dry. Dry weather gets me. This is a song that I wrote over 30 years ago when I was, youth, was the youth pastor and worship leader at Valley Christian Assembly. Some of you have been probably sang this song over the years. It's called High Lifted Up. It goes like this. High Lifted Up High Lifted Up I see you i 
powerful work of God going on in Vietnam. And uh, all of those pastors jumped to their feet and started, and started waving their hand and trying to sing it in English. <laughs> We're sons and daughters of the Father who reigns forevermore. You know what? I need my wife up here singing. How many of you would just say, Phyllis, go up there and sing with him? Phyllis, go up there and sing with him. And so do get her a microphone because I can't sing these low parts. And by the way, I thought there was an angel going in here singing earlier. And then, because I could hear, hear the bass, somebody singing bass, and I thought, well, the angels were singing with us. And I, saw them, I looked back and saw this brother singing a great bass back then. That's awesome. Are you on there? Are you going to forgive me? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Let's try it. We are sons and daughters of the Father who reigns forevermore. We are sons and Check one, two. Check one, two. 
My name is Drew. <laughs> Boy named Sue. How do you do? Now you All right. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. Doug, is that you back there? All right, Doug and Linda. We have we had seen them for years until we had the memorial for a plant. And so good to see you guys again. And and I just uh, I want to say thank you to Sister Kimpy for asking me to come, and us to come. And, and what I'm going to share with you today is really our life story. Uh, we wrote a book about it about oh, 10, 12 years ago. This book is called Freedom and Release, Hope for Captives and Prisoners. And uh, this book is, we preached it in a number of places across the nation, and uh, Florida, just different places. And because we do a lot of ministry in Greece, I've been going to Greece doing conferences for the last probably 12, 13 years. Been there probably eight, nine or ten times. And there's a move of God going on in Greece that we're glad to be a part of. And this message that I'm going to share with you, uh, I preached it there. And then we, we had printed the book. And they asked that they could take this book and print it in the Greek language. So they printed a thousand copies. And we're up in, you know how we, we say the, the, the book of Thessal, Thessalonians? Uh, the city is not Thessalonica, it, the city is Thessaloniki. That's how they pronounce it in Greece. And so we've had a lot of churches we've ministered to, books going into Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki today is in northern Greece and it has a million and a half people in it. There, uh, there are 100,000 university students there. We've been involved with ministry with some of those students. And then, of course, in Athens. In Athens, there are 6 million people in Athens. And uh, it's, it's, it's huge. And the gospel is going forth there. A mega church there would be 200. And, uh, you know, if I, go to, if I go to Ghana, West Africa, which I've been to twice, if I go there, I am. Uh, People say, oh, well, you're going, you're going to Africa. They'll give you money to go because you know, you're going to Africa. And, uh, but if I tell them I'm going to Greece, they think I'm going on vacation. But actually, there's a, great, a greater need for the gospel in Greece than there is Ghana, West Africa. Because Ghana, West Africa has 51% born again in the whole nation. In Greece, it's less than a half percent. In Greece. And uh, I can sit here all day and tell you all about Greece. Uh, my heart's there. Um, as I said, in other, other nations we've been in, uh, Mary and Joe, back here, have a son-in-law, Gary, Gary and Cindy Carnahan. And uh, Gary and I have been to many different nations together with, uh, with Dr. Dale Van Stenis. And I just want you to know that God's moving all over the world. Yes, amen. There's 20,000 Muslims a day coming to Christ. That's, that's 20,000 every day. There's so many people getting saved in China that by, by the year 2030, China will be the largest Christian nation on the planet. That's fascinating to me. Yeah. And if He comes, let it, that's fine. But until He comes, yeah. we've got to share this gospel. The Revival, Revival Center. I like to love the name of the church because wouldn't it be wonderful if America saw revival again? Amen. Amen. You know what we need? We need a revival like took place back in the 19 in the 1830s with Charles Finney. I don't know if you've ever read anything about Charles Finney. He was a lawyer that got saved, and when he got saved, he got on fire for Jesus, and he went into Rochester, New York, in about the 1830s. And in one year, a hundred thousand people became believers and followers of Jesus in Rochester, New York. You could not even find a job unless you were a born a born again Christian and were active in a local church. No one would hire you if you weren't if you weren't a believer. I learned that at a secular institution. And it wasn't coming from one of our Christian uh, TV stations. I learned it in college at East Central University in a history class. You couldn't even get a job, and a hundred thousand people in one year saved in Rochester, New York. 
Wonder what happened if, if, oh, if revival would break out like that here in America. Yeah, right? He would he he would walk into some of those textile mills and everybody would fall out on the on the floor under the power of God, and uh, and he'd lead whole factories to Jesus. I mean, if you want some fascinating history, but if, if you're like me, I don't want to just see. I don't want to just hear about it. Yeah. I want to be a part of it. Lord, as long as you have us here, we want to be a part of what you're doing in the earth to advance the gospel. I'm getting excited. I don't know if I'm going to preach about this book here or not. But... <laughs> All right, let's turn to Isaiah 61, verse 1. I usually have Phyllis read for me because... I'm having some tr difficulty with my eyesight. And uh, last year when I was in Vietnam, I got some bifocals because they were cheap over there. And so I went in and they got these glasses for me. And when they tested me, I can read great right here. But if I have my notes right there, I can't read so great. So that's what I get for a cheap pair of glasses. Anyway, so. <laughs> anyway so if, you'll, if you'll read Isaiah 61 and verse 1, and then we're going to go to Luke 4, verses 16 through 21. So I'll ask Sister Kimsey to find that in Luke 4, 16 through 21. And we're going to read it and start here. How much time do we, how late do we normally get out of here? Don't worry about it. Let's have church. All right. I've got to stand right here. No, you can move. I can move. Great. Right. Right. She moved with All right, go ahead. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. Okay, now let's go to Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. How far was I supposed to go? That's uh, 321. So. <clears throat> Any he closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were face fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Everybody say this day. This, this day. day. Everybody say today. 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 Jesus was, was uh, reading from the prophet Isaiah. And, uh, and as I began to read this several years ago, I begin to read about captives and prisoners. And I asked myself the question, I said, Lord, what is the difference between a captive and a prisoner? You know, we just kind of throw them together, you know, and, and we think that, that if a person is a captive, that those are the people who are out in the world sending and doing all, everything that they, they do out there. But we didn't know much about a difference between a captive and a prisoner. And as I began to research, I came up with some definitions that I think are biblical as we talk about captives and prisoners. And so I want to give you a definition first of captive. What is a captive? And a captive is anyone who has been violated against their own will. Whether they're a Christian or not. Anybody who's been violated against their own will. We had, uh, Phyllis and I knew a lady that when she was 24 years old, she went into Mexico and got uh, separated from the group that she was with and three, and, and three men drug her into a back alley and raped her. How many of you know that she was, she was a believer but she had been taken captive against her own will? Uh, there's a, a, a lady that, that Phyllis and I know and her and her husband years ago, they were, they were pastors of a church in Oklahoma. They had two small children. One day her husband comes home and he informs her that he's leaving her and the kids because he's going to go live with his homosexual lover. And how many of you know that that day 
that that wife and those two small children did not want that to happen. They became captives uh, against their own will. And, and, and you can, you know, uh, there's another guy sitting in my office. He's in his early 50s. And he's telling me a story of how when he was 10 years old, his uncle put a, put a gun to his head and forced him to do things that no one should ever have to do. How many of you know that that 10-year-old boy was taken captive against his, against his will? And all through the Bible, you can see where God's people were taken captive. How about Joseph? Was Joseph taken captive yeah. against his own will? How about the children of Israel when they were in bondage in, 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 in Egypt? And, and there's, there's, there's story after story after story of how God's people were taken captive. It's still going on today. And so, uh, then we got to looking at it scripturally. And uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Mount Zion. And they're, they're singing and they're dancing and they're praising. And there's a great celebration because the, the Ark of the Covenant speaks to us of the power and the presence of God. They were going to put it on top of Mount Zion where there was 24 hours of praise and worship going 24 hours a day around the clock. 4,000 singers and musicians. And so as they're going up that mountain, David's wife, Michael, looked out a window. And what, what did it say? It says that she despised him. When she saw him dancing, she despised him. How many of you remember that story? Yeah. All right. Now, uh, sometimes, like Paul Harvey, all of, all of us here would know who Paul Harvey is. Yeah. Uh, the younger generation doesn't know who Paul Harvey is, and, but we do. And so we want to give you the rest of the story as it relates to Michael. Because if you'll remember... Um, David had killed, had killed Goliath and he was the hero of Israel. And uh, after he killed Goliath, Saul told everyone, he said, uh, if anyone will go kill a hundred Philistines, he said, I'll give my daughter Michael to them to be married. So I think David took one look at her and said, I think she's worth 200. And so he went and killed 200 Philistines and Michael became his wife. And two times the Bible tells us that Michael loved David. It never told us, it never tells us that David loved Michael. But she loved him. Twice it says. And uh, later, as you know the story, David is running from King Saul and he's, he's running for his life and he left Michael behind as he ran with his, with his band of men. And he abandoned Michael. And she went back to her father's house, Saul. And Saul gave her to be married to another man named Pal Teal. And, they, and he loved her. They lived together for many, many, many years. And then years later, after Saul died and David became king, he got to thinking one day, he said, I wonder whatever happened... So that girl, let's see, what was her name? Oh, Michael, yeah. I wonder whatever happened to her. Uh, why, don't you go, why don't you go find her and bring her back to me? I think I want her again as my wife. And so the, I know I'm, I'm going to destroy everybody's picture of uh, David here. But if David's your favorite character, forgive me. Anyway, David says, I want her back as my wife. So the servants go to the home of Palatiel. And they get Michael and they're taking her to David. And the scripture tells us that Palatio followed along behind and he was weeping. Because he loved her. And so she became his wife again. And shortly after that, she looks out a window and sees David dancing. And the Bible says that she despised, that he des she despised him. Now you tell me why she despised David. Do you think she despised him because he was doing the two-step of dancing up? Uh, no. She had been taken a captive. She had been, been violated against her own will. And she became a captive. Everybody clear on that? Yes. Yeah. 
Well, if a captive is someone who's been violated against their own will, how about a prisoner? What's a prisoner? A better. A prisoner is someone who knowingly violates God's law, man's law, or both. Now, I better remember Uncle Vernon. <laughs> Let me just tell you this. Uncle Vernon didn't just happen to be driving through town that day with a sawed-off shotgun laying on the front seat. His car didn't just happen to pull into the bank, and he just didn't happen to go into the bank and, and put a gun in the face of a teller and say, give me all of your money. He knew. He knew what he was doing. And because he knew it, he became a prisoner. So a, a captive is someone who's been violated against their own will, but a prisoner is somebody who knows what they're doing. They know when we violate God's law, man's law, or both. Are you with me yeah. on this? All right, let's keep going. So what we see here is that the pastor who left the wife and two kids he violated God's law, so he became a prisoner. And he took captive his wife and two children. So that's how, that's how the, the process works. The good news is this. Alright? Here's the good news. Is that Jesus gives hope for all of us. Amen. Amen. How many of you Jesus can, can save and heal and deliver anybody? Alright? He came to set the captives free and bring release from darkness for the prisoners. Amen. So it doesn't matter if you and I have been a captive or if we have been a prisoner who have taken others captive. Yeah. The good news that, that Jesus says that He comes to set the captives free and bring release from darkness for the prisoners. And that's all of us. Amen. Because the truth is, I know in my life I've been both. I can sit here and tell you in ways and growing up of how I was violated against my, my own will and how things that happened that shouldn't have happened. And, and then as I, because you see what happens is if, if a captive does not get healed by Jesus, we, we mature in our dysfunction. And we become, we become the prisoners who then take more captives. And the truth is, is that you and I are, are maturing in one of two ways. We are either maturing in the kingdom of God or we are maturing in our dysfunction. Amen. If y'all talk to me and amen, we might get out of here a little quicker. <laughs> uh, be, I see you shaking your head. you got to help me out here, bro. And, uh, but if y'all just keep looking at me, man, we're gonna, it's going to be 10 o'clock before we get out of here. Amen. Yeah. My wife, she starts saying men at me. Like she starts saying men at me, I know it's time to quit. Anyway. All right. Let's look at characteristics of some captives and prisoners. Amen. <laughs> who, has, who has a big wad of keys? Oh, you got some keys? A whole big base. That is saying bass. Mama said at the old Glendale Assembly of God with Brother Smith. Yeah. Where I was a youth pastor, we had a lady. Her name was Sister Thompson, and she sat right in the third row. And she could see that. She looked back at that clock, and that clock got to be 12 straight up. She'd be like this. She'd sit this way at her seat. She looked at that clock. <laughs> and then she'd look over Brother Smith. <laughs> She started, she started rattling those keys. So, if I see some keys rattling, if I see, I'm going to keep these so you can't rattle them. No. But, that's how she would shut, shut the preacher down. So, hopefully this won't be too much, this must be too much longer. Alright, let's look at some, some characteristics of captives and prisoners. The first thing is if a person is a captive or if he is a prisoner, bitterness cripples them. Yeah. We've already talked about how that Michael was bitter. 
because she was taken captive. So I think we all, we're all matured enough. We, we, we understand that bitterness cripples, yeah. cripples us when we're a captive or a prisoner. The second thing that, that happens is when a captive or a prisoner is that they have no song. If you, if you look in Psalms 137 verses 1 through 4, we won't go there, but it's talking about the children of Israel, uh, those who were taken captive by the, in Babylonian captivity. And it says, Our captors said unto us, Play unto us the songs of Zion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because you see, Mount Zion was known because it was a place of worship. 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week, around the clock, the 4,000 singers and musicians, and across the world, the known world, everybody heard of the wonderful music and the, and the songs that came out of Mount Zion. And then when they took them captive, they said, they saw it with their harps. They said, so you must, you must be one of those that played on Mount Zion. Why don't you just play into us the songs of Zion? It says that they took their harps and they hung them up in the willow trees. And they said, how can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? I've been in this long enough and I know people. People that once couldn't wait to get to the house of God and as soon as the, the, the worship began, they're, they're worshiping and they're, and they're lifting up hands and then something happens. And you see them come in and they're like this. Some, they've lost their song. Yep. It's, because, it's because they've been taken captive or they're a prisoner. That causes someone to lose their song. The third thing is this. The third characteristic of captives and prisoners is that most of them live in shame. Everybody say shame. 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 Now I want to I'll, I'll give you the text. I, I'm not going to read from it. But in Joshua chapter 5 and verses 1 through 9, all of the men who left Egypt and lived in the wilderness, they died in the wilderness. Is that right? Yeah. All right. They had all been circumcised in Egypt, and all of those died in the wilderness. But all of them who were born in the wilderness, as soon as they go into the promised land, they, they cross over Jordan with Joshua. As soon as they go over to the promised land, the Lord says to Joshua, He said, I want you to circumcise all these men because they were born in the wilderness. And, and we don't have time to get in the, the covenant thing, but, but we need them to be circumcised because they've never been... As, as, as a part of the covenant, all right? And so, so they used something called flint knives. And I don't know what that was, but it wasn't a good day to be a man. That's all I got to say. It's not a good day to be a man. Amen. I got a man out of here. All right. <laughs> But, but here, here's the fascinating, listen, here's the fascinating thing about that. Is that after they were all circumcised, the Lord said this to Joshua. He said, this day, everybody say today. Today. Today, today I have rolled away the reproach uh -huh. of Egypt. Yes. He didn't say reproach of the wilderness. He said, I have rolled away the reproach of of Egypt. And that word reproach is the same word that is used for the word shame. He said, this day I have rolled away the shame of Egypt. None of them had ever lived in Egypt. Now that'll preach. Praise God. None of them had ever lived in Egypt. But God was dealing with something that was attached to them. Mm -hmm. From generation to generation. Right. Yeah. And whether we want to admit it or not, there's a history that God deals with us in. Right. Yeah. There's a history. Thank you, Jesus. 
So the Lord was dealing. He was dealing with the history. He was dealing with mindsets. He was dealing with, with lifestyles. And when I think about that word shame, for the most part in the church, we don't know too much about shame. I felt like the Lord gave me some things about this. And uh, I want to give you a, defini a definition for guilt and shame because we don't really know the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt says this. Guilt says I made a mistake. How many of you here have ever made a mistake? Yeah. <laughs> Three people are thinking they made a mistake coming here tonight. But anyway, uh, we've all made mistakes. We've all been guilty. That's why we need blood. Right? But shame says this. Shame says I am a mistake. And there is a difference between I made a mistake or I am a mistake. We have three sons who are incredible men of God, have traveled the nation, ministered music in 35 states. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Dutch Sheet Ministries, they travel the nation with Dutch Sheets. I've watched them twice on God TV, They're gifted way beyond anything that we've ever done in teaching and in music. And I want you to know that raising three sons, that they made mistakes. But they aren't mistakes. Oh, right? Uh -huh. Guilt says I made a mistake. Shame says I am a mistake. And as the Lord was showing me this, I got to thinking about Peter and Judas. Now, we all know the story of Peter, loud mouth. When he when, when they're at the Lord's Supper, when when, when he told the when he told Jesus, he said, I don't you know, I don't know about these other yo-yos, but you can count me in, I will never. I will never deny you. Do you think he meant that? Yes. Yeah, he meant it. Yes. How many of us have ever told the Lord we're going to do something and we did it? And when we said it, we, we, we were determined that that was going to happen, but we missed it. Well, that's Peter. I mean, Peter cursed him. He denied that he even knew him. And then we look at Judas, because we beat Judas up pretty bad. He's the one that betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Turned him over to be taken. And uh, one translation says that when he came back with the 30 pieces of silver and he threw them down, one of the, one of the root words means uh, repented. He repented. And then he went out and killed himself. Now let me ask you this. Do you think that what Judas did was worse than what Peter did? No. I don't think it was. But I just know this. That Peter was dealing with guilt guilt that says I made a mistake and we've all made mistakes but Judas was dealing with shame shame that said I'm a mistake there's no doubt he probably there had to be something in him that wanted to, wanted to be able to go back but that but the shame shame is deadly it will call everyone who I've ever counseled or talked to that has either attempt, attempted suicide or contemplated suicide, they're every one of them live in shame. Shame that says my, my family won't even miss me. The, nobody, if I kill myself, if things are going to be better. Shame is a killer. And so Peter was dealing with the guilt that said I made a mistake. Judas was dealing with shame that says I am a mistake. And it drove him to kill himself. We okay with that? I need an amen about right now. Amen. Yeah. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. How can we be healed? Well, the first thing that needs to happen is we have to stay in camp. Everybody say, stay in camp. Stay in camp. 
Remember when they circumcised them? The next verse, I think it's verse 10, it says that they all stayed in camp until they were healed. If they, would have, if they hadn't stayed in camp until they were healed, they would have been a pretty ragtag army going off to, Amen. to do battle. Stay in camp, they're healed. I pastored the same church in Oklahoma for almost 25 years. And Sister Kimsey, you've been in ministry all these many years, and, and you know as well as I do that uh, people will come to church and they'll tap me on the shoulder and they say, Oh, I've been praying for a church like this. I think one guy told me, he said, You're, you're such a good preacher. You need to be on TV. And people, Doug, they'll pat us on the back and, and, and tell us, and then six months later they're gone. Because you know what happens? It's because after a while the ugly in me rubs up against the ugly in them and we, we leave camp before God gets to heal us. Because the truth is we cannot be healed by ourselves. God uses other people to bring healing into our lives. And so we can't go on. We, we, we can't go on and, 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 and see Jericho's fall. We can't go on and, and see our promised land taken with the gospel. Because we leave camp. They stayed in camp. Lord help us to stay in camp. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. The second thing is this, is that we have to believe what God says about us is true. Yeah. Everybody that knows you has an opinion about you, good or bad or indifferent. We have to stay in camp, and then we have we have to uh, believe that what God says about us is true. And He says that you and I are the righteousness of a God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And we can't. It doesn't matter what other people say. Well, He used to do this. Oh, you know I don't know. What does the Father? The Father looks at me and calls me a son. Yeah, yeah. The Father looks at you and calls you a daughter. Hallelujah. And I don't care what other people say, He knows who the sons and daughters are. That's it, That's right. man. And then the last thing, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Yeah. <laughs> if you want to get healed, you got to quit waiting for an apology. <laughs> Oh, amen. Oh. <laughs> I spent all of my life waiting for an apology from my father. Doug, I could play a little hoop with my dad. I remember when I was a senior, I got to play. We, we went to the state semifinals, and I, I got to play in the Coliseum with Phoenix Suns play. I made the first team all tournament. We got beat, but... I made the alternative team. My father never went to a basketball game to watch me. When I was a, when I was a kid growing up, I was an all-star catcher. My brother, twin brother, was an all-star pitcher. And my dad never came to a game. And when I went on up into high school, we played ball, and uh, daddy wasn't there when I was playing the state championship. He's fishing at Roosevelt, and I had issues. I waited all my life to get an apology from my father until the Lord showed me this. You remember when they came to arrest Jesus? And Peter was going to defend him. And what did he do? He took out his sword. And he swung it. That servant of Mount, Mount Kiss, the high priest, he took that sword and was going to kill him and, and it cut his ear off. Mm -hmm. Went plop right on the ground. <laughs> So what did Jesus do? Well, let me tell you first. Let me tell you first what Jesus didn't do. He didn't say this. Now, Peter, you quit that and you tell him you're sorry. <laughs> Listen to this. Without an apology from Peter, Jesus took that severed piece of his body and he completely healed it. And for people like me and people like you, we've been captives and prisoners and pieces of our heart have been severed and fallen off. Uh, 
without an apology from whoever did it to us, he can, he can pick them up and he can heal the wounds in our hearts and lives. Yeah. That gives me hope. Amen. That gives us hope. Yes. yes. Amen. I was preaching this in Florida about three years ago. A couple hundred people there. It's the first time I'd ever preached there. And uh, we finished Sunday morning. I flew home Monday. On Tuesday, the pastor of the church calls me. And he said, Drew, he said, uh, there was a guy that was here at the service Sunday. And he just came by the office and wanted to know, he wanted to get a copy of the, the message he preached Sunday. He wanted to get a copy of your book. And he wanted to know if it was okay if he called you to talk to you. I said, sure. Here's the story. This guy was a pastor in Virginia. Assembly of God. He and his wife, he took a church of about 200 and went to somewhere between two and 3,000. Great work. And uh, his wife had an affair. And so he, he, they stepped away from the church to try to have some healing and reconciliation. And she ended up leaving him and going off with another man. And he moved to Florida. And he hadn't been... He'd been 16 years since he'd been in a pulpit. That Sunday morning, he walked into the church, and I'm preaching about guilt and shame and captives and prisoners, and how that God can heal you without an apology from the one who wounded you. And he called me, and these were his words. He said, I left church for the first time. He was now about 62 years old. He said, For the first time in 16 years, I felt like God could still use me. I've been in touch with him ever since. He started a little church in Florida. And God's using him. How many are glad for Jesus? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we a lot of us have been captives in prison. We thank you, Lord, that you came to set the captives free and to release those of us who are in darkness and prison. And Lord, we've all made mistakes. We understand guilt. But Lord, I just believe as I was sharing this about shame, there's somebody here, maybe a light was going off and saying, that's what I've been fighting all these years and I never knew it. I knew all about guilt, but I never knew shame. Lord, I just pray that here tonight you free us. Free us from guilt yes. and shame. And for those of us who waited for an apology, there may be somebody here that's had a son or a daughter that's their relationship has been broken. It's not like you want it. Lord, I pray for healing and restoration. And I pray on both sides, that, Lord, that you would bring healing to the womb without an apology from anyone. We thank you. I'm just going to do this quick. If you're here and you say, Pastor Drew, this message has touched my heart in a, in a way. I was preaching in Southern California one day and a man that was about 65 came up and he was so broken. And he told me, he said, 40 years ago I was on a business trip and I had a one night stand 
And he said, I've lived in the guilt and the shame of it for 40 years. And we saw the Lord touch him in a powerful way. If you're here and you say, I, I'd like to have some prayer for my own heart, my own life. I want to pray for you. Yes. If that's you, you can just stand where you are. Or if you're seated and you, you just need to stay seated, you can just right where you are, you can just lift your hand. So I'll know. I'm going to pray for something. If there's any. Any here tonight? Thank you, Jesus. There's a lot of you here in situations with sons or daughters or relatives. Lord wants to heal that. Feel so much. Can you come over here and just lay hands on this sister here? been that way for years. It goes way back. It goes way back when you were a girl. The Lord says today. Everybody say today. The Lord says today I'm rolling away the shame. I'm rolling away the shame of Egypt in your life. You fight with all you can and you do all you know to do but tonight there's a light that's gone off in your spirit not just in your head but in your spirit and the shame of Egypt is being rolled away today not tomorrow not in a month of day but today you're not going to have to wait for an apology. Because the Lord says that He's picking up those severed pieces of your heart. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He's putting them right back. And it's been so long that you've had a heart that you felt was, was, was not just clean but healthy. You can't remember. The Lord says today He's restoring health. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! What you've been walking through has affected your body physically. You're going to find that out after today. That shame is going and, and your body is going to, there's going to be changes take place in your physical body and healing is going to take, is taking place. He's not just touching your spirit or, or your mind. He's touching your body today. The shame is rolling off. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let me tell you. There was a lady in our church that got saved in our church. And for 14 years, for 14 years, she had not seen her son. She didn't know if he was alive or dead. Relationship broken. Harsh. Don't even have time to tell all that went on. Didn't even know if he was dead or alive. And I'm preaching one Sunday morning. And the Lord just gave me a word. And I said, Beverly, she sat right back there. I said, Beverly, the Lord says he's going to heal the relationship between you and your son. That week he called. That week. And their relationship has been mended and healed. And she got elderly. She's now in a nursing home because she's, she's elderly and had a stroke. But thank God before that happened, yeah. there was a healing and a restoration that took place between her and her, her prodigal.
prodigal son. If you're here today and you've got a son or a daughter that's a prodigal running around out there, I want you to just let, raise your hand. I'm going to pray for them. Come on. Just keep your hand down. I, I got to tell you this. When I was a kid, 12 years old, my mama, when it got dark, she'd step out in the backyard there at Marincy, Arizona, and she'd say, Drew and David, it's dark, come home. It's time to come home. And we would hear her three, four houses down the way. And I'm telling you what the Lord wants to do is that he wants our cry to go out to what we call them out of the darkness into the marvelous light. So Lord, we have hands lifted up here today. some more people physically. Eight years ago on Valentine's Day, it was a Sunday. My friend Dale Van Cenas was speaking at our church. He and I had been together in Africa and he preached a powerful message on the Holy Spirit. I said, when you come to my church, I said, I have some people who need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want you to speak on that. There was a lady that came and she was wearing a mask, like a surgical mask. So obviously she was sick or something. And so she comes in, sits over here. She got her husband and two teenagers with her. She's 40 years old. Dale got through preaching and he gave the invitation for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. She had been a good little Baptist girl. She came forward, standing right here among others. And the moment that he laid hands on her, there was a violent, there was a violent stream of the Holy Ghost that began to pour out of her as loud and long as I've ever witnessed in my life. And she stood in our pulpit, she stood in our altar from 10 minutes till 12 to about 1.15 praying violently. She prayed so hard that that mask fell off. I laid hands on her and prophesied over her how that God was he bringing healing and, rest and restoration to her. And this was her story. She had chronic Lyme disease for three years. There's a lot of it back where we live. You get, you get it from a tick bite. She was, had a pet grooming business and got a tick bite. And she had been sick. Lyme disease will affect you like Parkinson's or MS. And you will die from Lyme. You will die a slow death from Lyme disease. That morning, she, somebody had invited her to church. That morning, she could not even put her clothes on. Her husband had to dress her and had to put that mask on her. And when she got through, she walked out of that church completely whole in the name of Jesus, completely whole. She went home. She had a port in her chest where she gave herself shots three times a week. She took 25 pills a day because there was a specialist that saw her from Dallas, Texas. He was a doctor for three years. Every Monday morning they would come and they would take her blood because her immune system, her, her, her blood count was so bad. They said, if you go out in public, you got to wear a mask because you will get sick and you will die. Well, Monday morning, they came took the blood. They called back on Monday afternoon. They said, we don't understand this, but your blood's normal. Hallelujah. <laughs> right. Imagine that. Glory. 
So she called her doctor office and told him that she pulled the port out herself. <laughs> I don't know. That couldn't have been worse than circumcision, but anyway. <laughs> I'm sure it was hard. She pulled the port out. She quit taking <coughs> pills, and when the doctor's office heard it, they said, you cannot stop taking that medication because the side effects, and you just stopping it all at once, there's all kinds of problems. He said, I want to see you in my office tomorrow. She walked into his office on Tuesday morning, and he turned and saw her, and he said, whoa, what happened to you? <laughs> and she said, two days ago, I went to church, and Jesus healed me. He said, well, we'll see. We'll see. He tested her for two weeks. Did everything that he knew to do to test back and forth from Oklahoma, we're two hours away from Dallas, and back and forth, and finally he just shook his head, pushed back from his desk, and he said, I have to admit that you're the first true miracle that I have ever seen in my life. I'm telling you, I can stand here for two hours and tell you story after story like that, but I'm not going to do it because everybody said, hey, Amen. Amen. <laughs> but if you need a healing in your body, I want you to lift your hand. If you need a healing in your body, I want you to lift your hand. And here, here's what I'm finding. The Bible says that believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. It doesn't say the preacher or the evangelist or, who, or, or, or the prophet on TV. It says believers will lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. So if you're, if you're near someone, if, 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 is, that, is that a raised up hand right there? All right. Brother, reach up there. Let's go back there. Just make sure everybody's got a hand up. Has got a, somebody's laying a hand on them. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Holy Ghost, come. Holy Ghost. Jesus. Lord, let there be a release. Let there be an unction. Let there be an unction of the Holy Ghost. We lay hands on the sick. We believe in you, Lord. Healing and restoration. Our bodies. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I believe there are going to be some testimonies come Sunday. There are going to be some testimonies come Sunday. I promise this is my last close. <laughs> uh, we've got just a few of these books. Everything I said today is in that book and more. We're selling for $5 or two for 10. Uh, the economy in Oklahoma is rough right now, so. <laughs> if you don't have $5, I'll give you. <coughs> Last Sunday, I preached at a church, and we were praying for 40 or 50 people across the front, and my niece was there. I had introduced her, and a person wanted to buy books and gave her $20 for books, and she came over and put it in, in one of the books, and I ended up <laughs> giving three or four away, so I gave one book away, and it had a $20 bill in it. <laughs> so you just never know. You might get one of those, those books. You might get one of those books. <laughs> I promise I'll, I'll say it. One day I got a phone call. I'm in my office. This lady, she said, you don't know me. I live 50 miles away. My pastor knows who you are. He told me to call you. He said, my uncle 
lives about a quarter of a mile from your church. And he has been given six months to live with pancreatic, pancreatic cancer. Would you go see him? I said, yes, I will. I knew who he was. He knew who I was. We never ever really talked. We just knew. I sat down in the living room with him. He's sitting here. Chair. His name is Lonnie. I said, Lonnie, I want to tell you. This is not a sympathy visit. I didn't come here just to, for sympathy. I came here because I believe Jesus wants to touch your life. And he said, oh, Brother Drew. He said, I was raised up. He was 59 years old. He said, I was raised up down in the hills of McAllister. And we was lucky to get to, get to town once every two weeks. Much less get to church. And I said, Lonnie, I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about Grace Community Church or the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or the Somebody God Church or whatever church. The Bible just says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, Lonnie, you can do that right there in that chair. Or tonight when you lay your head on your pillow, you can call out on Jesus and He'll save you. Or at the breakfast table in the morning. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And then He did something that I have never seen before or since. And it was like this. He started calling out. Weeping. Jesus! Jesus! Come save me, Jesus! Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus, come save me! I get chills every time I tell this. He did that for three or four minutes, and then all of a sudden his eyes got real big and he looked over at me. He said, you see that? I said, see what? He said, that right there! You, did you see that? And I said, see what? He said, I can't believe you didn't see what I saw. I said, what'd you see? He said, I saw a huge hand come down into the living room. You didn't see that hand? I can't believe you didn't see that hand. And he said, then I saw it go back up. I can't believe you didn't see that. I said, Lonnie, what do you think that was? He said, I guess it was God. And I said, Lonnie, do you think maybe God's showing you that His hand is big enough to reach you right where you are? I led him to Jesus. He got saved. A month later, I'm here in Phoenix doing some ministry and I'm having dinner with Gary and Cindy. And I said, man, I've got to tell you this story about this guy. I got, and I'm right in the middle of telling that story and my phone rings and it's his family and they said Lonnie just passed away we want to have his funeral on Tuesday and we should have wanted you to do it well, it's Friday night I'm in Phoenix and I got ministers Sunday and I told them I'll be there and there were 150 rednecks we got any rednecks out here? Got, got a lot of them. We got a lot of rednecks where I live. I mean, they come, they come to church pulling their horse trailers. And got stuff on their boots. I mean, I'm telling you, a lot of them there. But there was 150 guys just like Lonnie, and I, they, they heard how that God saved Lonnie, and He never darkened the door of church. I'm really glad our God's that big. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Kimsey. We've it's a joy to be here. And uh, we love y'all and, and we hope to see you again. All right? Bless you. God bless you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, we are our revival center. Hallelujah. I think Brother Drew ought to come back sometime and preach us more. Amen. 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 Oh, God is so great and mighty and beyond what we can awesome. imagine or think. Hallelujah. 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 You know, just reach out and touch Jesus and receive your miracle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Awesome word. Awesome word. Hallelujah.
praise God. Let's sing that chorus. Reach out and touch the Lord. Can we do that? Stand up with me as we're going to be dismissed. Thank you, Brother Drew. That was awesome. Reach out and touch the Lord. churches today, they're going to go by the clock. Uh, one hour. They're taught. You have a ch church for one hour. Yeah. No, oh, you have a meeting. I just get started the first hour. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. But it's Amen. good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank yes. you all for coming. And, and may God, just, just like I said, keep thinking on this. And, and whatever's going on in your life, let God take care of it. It is, He can do anything. There's nothing Amen. impossible with our God. I thank God. You know, there's a song that said He can do it again. Yeah. Look where you've been, and He can do it one more time. And I trust that you'll just let this word sink, sink, sink. You know, Jesus said at one time, let this saying sink deep, deep in your ears. So that's what we need to do. Father, tonight we thank You for the Word and for the ministry. God, to those that have needs in this building tonight, in this congregation. Father, I pray that we will go out of here with a fresh anointing and a fresh desire to witness. To tell people that God is real. There's a lot of people that have, even though they've been Christians at one time, has lost faith in God. But let us be your voice, your hand extended, reaching out to those that are lost and oppressed. And in prison and in and are in captivity. In Jesus' name. And everybody said Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Love